Well, welcome everybody, and thank you for joining us here this evening. I am so grateful that it looks to be almost standing room only. It means that this issue is finally starting to tipping over closer to mainstream. Many thanks to those of you here tonight who have been working independently in your own communities and starting the conversation about safe technology. So welcome to questioning the safety of our children's exposure to wireless radiation in schools. And just to give you an overview of how the evening will go, I will have the honor and privilege of introducing our expert speakers. I mostly just figured this out on my own and learned how to connect the dots to teach other people. So we will go through expert presentations that will last probably 10 to 15 minutes per. And uh, then we will focus on solutions. What can we do to protect our children in schools as well as in our homes and wherever else we go? But tonight's focus is on schools. And then we will do a question and answer session. And because of the way our technology is set up tonight, it won't work to be passing a microphone around. So instead, what we'll do is we'll ask you to put questions on an index card, and we will field them from the podium. So I fell down the rabbit hole with this issue over five years ago now. I used to help run the local education foundation in my town of Ashland. And I, you know, we were all hearing about this 21st century classroom and how all of our children were going to need to have all this stuff to succeed in the world. So a bunch of us jumped in and started doing fundraisers, and we brought in this technology. And then at book group one night, a girlfriend of mine who's an electrical engineer said there could be something up with wireless technology. And sure enough, once you do get past the cursory search, and say, is Wi-Fi safe, you will find studies that say, oh, we did studies and there was no harm. I didn't know it at the time. Those are primarily industry-funded studies. But once you look at the peer-reviewed, published, non-industry-funded scientific literature, I was just astounded that there are literally thousands of studies all over the world showing biological effects. So I raised this with my school committee, with our superintendent, with our school nurses, with anybody who would listen. And at first I got back crickets, like literally nothing. And our district was going through a lot of change at the time. I think we were on our fifth or sixth superintendent in as many years. And so um, once they started looking at it, though, they formed a committee. And I think it was actually when they got to the legal fine print that they realized we probably should do something here. So Ashland Public Schools became the first in the nation. And with great thanks to Dr. Deborah Davis, when I met her, she's the one who told me we were the first in the nation. Turn off the devices when not in use. Turn Wi-Fi on only when needed. Always put it on a solid surface, preferably not a metal one, because metal amplifies radiation. And then they offered to show people the product guides where they, too, could read the fine print. So does anybody in here have an iPhone with them this evening? OK. Um, let, me ask, <laughs> let me ask you to take it out. And if you don't have one, you might want to look along with a neighbor. And give me a nod when you can get it out and get it into settings. Okay, and then an easy way to remember how to share this with your colleagues and loved ones in your town is remember the acronym GAL, like this GAL at the library taught me this little party trick. Um, from settings, you go into general, you just scroll down a little ways to general and hit that. And then up at the top, the A is for about, hit that. And then scroll all the way down to legal, all the way down, it's second from the bottom. And at the bottom of legal, you'll see RF exposure, which is radio frequency microwave radiation that the industry politely calls energy. And in that legal fine print, they tell us two really important things. One, keep this device X amount of distance from your body, or you may exceed the FCC limits for public radiation exposure. And two, use a hands-free option, because they don't come right out and tell us, but that one device has five or six separate antennas constantly pulsing a microwave radiation signal to make or maintain a handshake with the nearest cell tower or router. And we don't need that. So um, if you have to make a call, 
turn all those other antennas off. If you have to send a text, turn all those other antennas off because you've got one in there for cellular, one for data, one for Bluetooth, one for Wi-Fi, one for locator, and by now one for a public hotspot because the industry is using us as their network. Who would know, right? So for tonight, if you would be so kind, every wireless device that you have with you right now, if you can put it in airplane mode, we would ask that you do that. We haven't been trained on this really, but it's like secondhand radiation. You're sitting there with your device and it's going out like this, pulsing everybody around you. So I would ask that everybody put every wireless device in airplane mode before we get started with the rest of our program. Okay. Ooh, look at the fine print with deep thanks to the Environmental Health Trust for putting up this website. You can go out and see the fine print and when you look at the Apple iPads, seizures, blackouts, eye strain, and it just goes on and on and nobody knows and we keep giving these children this technology. So, it is my pleasure to introduce to you our first speaker tonight, Dr. David Carpenter, public health physician out of Harvard training. He has been the director for the Institute for Health and Environment, which is part of the World Health Organization. And he is a professor and former dean at the University of Albany School of Public Health. He's also held positions at the National Institutes of Health, the Armed Forces Radiobiology Research Institute, and has authored in his big career, over 400 publications, five books, and more. So please give a warm welcome to Dr. David Carpenter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And that's the mission over there. Well, thank you very much, Cece, and thank you for coming tonight. I've got 10 minutes to, to give you basically an introduction to this field. And I've got a lot of data in these slides. So uh, let's uh, go through them fairly quickly. And I hope that the slides will be made available because there's some things in them that I can't possibly uh, talk about in a short period of time. This is the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, at that end, we have high frequency radiation. First of all, what is electromagnetic, electromagnetic waves? Well, these are particles of energy that don't have any mass. And visible light is what we know best. Visible light, the, you know, the, the range from red to purple is just varying in frequency. And that's what we have down here. Uh, this is the visible light. Now, at higher frequencies, we have X-rays and gamma rays and cosmic rays. And this is what's known as ionizing radiation because there's enough energy in that radiation to directly damage DNA. Then below visible light, we have infrared radiation. That's life on Earth would not be possible without the heat from the sun. That's infrared radiation. And below that, we have the communication frequencies. Uh, and basically, most of those are, are what would be called microwaves. Now, people have been skeptical that there could be any adverse health effect at lower frequencies because obviously life on Earth was dependent on both visible light and infrared radiation. But when you put a potato in your microwave oven, it obviously cooks the potato. So it's not a totally benign thing. And uh, what I'm going to talk about, and I think other speakers tonight will talk about, is the magnitude of the evidence that there are adverse health effects of the, these forms of radio frequency radiation below that of visible light at intensities that don't just cook your brain or cook your potato. So uh, the International Agency for Research on Cancer is part of the World Health Organization. It's based in Lyon, France. And these are the ultimate re uh, authorities on what things cause cancer. And in uh, 2011, they rated radio frequency radiation as a possible human carcinogen. And that evidence was based primarily in the fact that people would talk on their cell phone for long periods of time and don't pay attention to the, the, the recommendations to keep it away from your head, uh, but hold it right up against their head, which most of us do because no one knows about that fine print. Uh, 
If you talk on your cell phone for 10 years or more, multiple hours a day, your risk of developing brain cancer is sky high. And it's the worst kind of brain cancer, the glioblastoma. That's the kind Ted Kennedy had, John McCain had, uh, uh, Bell, B Bowden had Bell Biden had, uh, and all people that spent a lot of time in their cell phones. You can never say in one particular case that it was causative, but it's certainly suggestive. Now, the reason it wasn't a stronger recommendation at this time was that nobody had ever de demonstrated that animals developed cancer from cell phone frequency radiations. That changed a year ago when the US National Toxicology Program exposed rats for the duration of their lifetime to cell phone frequency radiations, and they developed the same two cancers that we see in people. Radio frequency radiation at intense level causes cancer. Now, well, everyone thinks our government's going to protect us from any things that are dangerous. Well, think again. In the US, the Federal Communications Commission is the organization responsible for setting standards for our cell phones, for our Wi-Fi, and things like that. Uh, and they say, well, you know, we don't really have standards, we have recommendations. And uh, if you're really concerned about it, there's some things you can do. Use a speaker phone, use, don't use your cell phone, use a, a landline, a whole variety of things you can do. But they have standards that are grossly out of date. Now, the G Government Accounting Office has begun to look over the shoulder of the Federal Communications Commission. And they are saying, you know, you haven't really given very much in the way of advice or standards. Now, I went with a colleague to the FCC a couple of years ago trying to understand why they have such ludicrously inaccurate standards. Basically, the FCC says if your brain doesn't heat when you talk on a cell phone or if your body doesn't heat when you're in a Wi-Fi environment, there's no problem. Well, that is just, it totally ignores an enormous body of evidence from scientists around the world that show there are multiple adverse health effects. Cancer's a big one. Uh, men that hold a wireless laptop on their lap too long will have reduced sperm counts. That usually gets the men's attention. Uh, there are women that put their cell phone in their bra have an elevated risk of breast cancer. And now we're beginning to understand that there's a whole syndrome called electrohypersensitivity where some people are unusually sensitive to exposure to radio frequency radiation and even electricity related magnetic fields and develop a syndrome that consists of fatigue and headache and a feeling their brain isn't working right and pain of various sorts. Uh, but the FCC hasn't really dealt with this. Now, here's the guidelines in the US, Australia, Canada, relative to some other countries in the world. Now, actually, I'm a little suspicious about some of these guidelines because it's pretty well known that even though some of these countries have official guidelines, they don't enforce them very well. But you can see how outrageously out of sync the US is with other countries in terms of recommendations in terms of exposure. And that very high level of radiation limits is all set to prevent your brain from being heated when you talk on your cell phone or when you're exposed to any other form of uh, radio frequency radiation. It's short-term exposure. Uh, I've forgotten, I think it's one minute, something like that, very brief exposure that isn't going to cook your brain. But think about our lives. We are exposed to this radiation continuously. Uh, CC had to ask people to turn off their cell phones. Well, if your cell phone is on, it's, it's communicating with the cell tower. If you talk on it, it's going to communicate much more. And in this room, I, I suspect probably half of people have cell phones with them. Uh, I do. I have it in my pocket. Uh, it's never turned on. I don't know my own number, which makes my, my students think I'm absolutely crazy. But I use it when I travel. And I just came back 
I was in LA this morning. So I, I use it and I, I have it to tell my wife to come and pick me up after this meeting is over. But it's not turned on. And as I say, I don't know my own number. But so the FCC has these limits. All right, 30 minutes of 100 microwatts per centimeter. And we know those are wrong. Now, where did those limits come from? Well, they came from the engineering community and the physics community, not the health community. When Cindy Sage and I went to the FCC, they said, well, we don't have any health expertise. We get all of our advice from EPA and NIH and other health agencies. Well, those health agencies have no advice at all to give. EPA discontinued all of their research functions on electromagnetic fields. NIEHS hasn't had any activity on this issue for years. So the question that short-term exposure can cause thermal damage, yes. But even there, there's good evidence that many cell phones exceed the guidelines, especially when people hold them to their ears. So we've got real problems in that uh, many people unknowingly, they don't know this, this issue, and yet they're, they're exposed at, at dangerous levels of radio frequency radiation. Now, uh, my colleague Dominic Belpom in Paris uh, uh, has done some wonderful studies trying to, as I said, there was a problem that uh, people were skeptical that uh, we have all this evidence that people get cancer from electromagnetic fields, but until you show that animals get cancer, they didn't believe it. It's the reverse situation from studies of chemicals, where we usually know that we study chemicals in animals first, and then we, we begin to look in people. But here we've got enormous amount of evidence that people develop cancer, develop these other diseases from this exposure, but they didn't want to believe it until we showed that, the, that you have cancer in animals. We have that evidence now. Uh, one other issue has been that there weren't clinical chemistry tests. You couldn't take a blood sample or urine sample and identify people that suffered from this syndrome of electrohypersensitivity. Uh, electrohypersensitivity, these are relatively nonspecific symptoms. We all get headaches every now and then. We all feel like our brain doesn't work right <coughs> quite often. Uh, we all get tired. Uh, but when people find that if they go into the presence, in the presence of high levels electromagnetic fields, those symptoms appear in spades. And many people are totally disabled because of their having to be in an environment where they're exposed. Dr. Belpom and his colleagues have now found a whole series of tests in blood and urine. None of them are 100 percent, but they distinguish people that have electrohypersensitivity from people that do not. Unfortunately, these are not standard tests. I have people calling me constantly saying, where can I go and get these tests? Uh, my answer is go to Paris. It's about the only place I know where you can get most of them. But we are beginning now to find rigorous clinical tests that will distinguish electrohypersensitivity <laughs> subjects from other people. It's a real disease, and it can be very disabling. Now, uh, this is uh, the job accommodation network. And one of the big issues here is how do we protect people that have this illness? Uh, people that can't continue on the job they used to have because the environment is full of radio frequency fields that cause them to be ill or particularly in the, in the reason we're talking here tonight, students that are electrosensitive that have to go to school, but the school has so much radio frequency radiation that the students get ill. You think about schools today. Most schools have Wi-Fi throughout the school. Think about the computer classroom. Now, it's very important that everybody have access to the net the internet, that they learn to use it. It's a, it's, a, it's a critical part of our society. But if you have 20 or 30 kids in a wireless computer classroom with one big router up there, those kids are basically in a mini microwave oven. 
because all of the laptops are communica communicating. And is it any wonder that some of the kids become ill? I say no. So this job accommodation network suggests some things that can be done to help accommodate people that suffer from electrohypersensitivity. Uh, and if, if you think it's bad now, uh, let me just warn you that the rate we're going is going to get worse. There's implementation of 5G, the next generation uh, wireless communication, which is going to result in many cell towers put in front of every fifth or sixth house. You're not going to be able to walk down the sidewalk without being continuously exposed. You're not going to be live, able to live in your home without being continuously exposed at levels much greater than we have now. But relocate re workplaces away from areas where symptoms are triggered. Change the employee's shift to allow them to work at times when everybody else has gone home with their cell phones. Uh, provide handset extenders or alternate headsets. Little simple things that can be done that can make an enormous difference. Now, uh, one of the things that Dr. Belpom has shown is that many of the people that are sensitive to electric, electromagnetic fields are also sensitive to chemicals. And there are many people that have that syndrome that also have chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia. I've had a major study of Gulf War illness where veterans from the 1990 Gulf War uh, developed the same set of symptoms, probably because of some environmental exposure. We don't know exactly what it is. There must be something in common with all of these things. And Dr. Belpom's work has shown that some of these same clinical uh, blood and urine assays are, are, are found uh, in, uh, in individuals with uh, a multiple chemical sensitivity. So uh, there are a whole variety of things that can be done to accommodate people that are electrosensitivity, electrosensitive. And this is one of Dr. Belpom's uh, manuscripts that uh, describe that. It's interesting that he and I and colleagues from four other European countries went to the World Health Organization in Geneva two years ago to try to get them to change their position on the level of hazard. We basically got nowhere. Uh, what they told us is they take all of their advice from the international ICNRP, International Radiation Protection Advisory Committee. It's a self-appointed group that has long history of ties to the industry, and they are they they advise the uh, the FCC, most governments, true in Canada as well, and and yet they're they're totally inappropriate. They're not the people that have uh, have demonstrated the hazards that we we uh, know exist. Now this is just a, one example of a situation in school. This is where the wireless equipment is close to where students are. So, of course, the students are going to be highly exposed. Now, not everyone is going to respond with the same sim symptoms. There's a variety of susceptibilities. There are probably a lot of people that have symptoms that don't recognize what they come from. But in schools, it's pretty clear when a child gets a headache every time he goes to school and recovers when they go home. Access points in school classrooms and dorms uh, that are against Federal Communication Commission guidelines are common. And, and these are just examples in one school of that. Now, these are measurements taken in a meter that detects radio frequency radiation. The top is from a school that has limited use of, de of devices. And the bottom is from a school that has extensive use. Each of those peaks is a peak of radial frequency radiation. And you know, one of the issues is the FCC standards will average those over long periods of time. We have increasing evidence that it isn't just the average overall that's important. It's the rapid on and off. And you see how many of those massive peaks there are there. Here are just some other examples of school readings every three seconds uh, versus the coffee shop readings. Now, coffee shops often have Wi-Fi. You can't go into a McDonald's or a Starbucks without being in a Wi-Fi environment. 
And some very electrosensitive people get sick when they do that. But you can see how some schools, because of this idea that you have to make everybody accessible to uh, the internet by their laptop, by their pad, by their cell phone, and that's the result in terms of exposure. The Bioinitiative Report is an encyclopedic listing of health effects. It's more than you ever wanted to know. You can find it at www.bioinitiative.org. I was the co-editor-in-chief for this report. Uh, it's, as I say, it's encyclopedic. It takes, takes each of the health effects, each of the organ systems, and provides information. Uh, the, the point is just to provide this as a frame of reference, not to go into the great details, because uh, our, our focus tonight is the situation in schools, and particularly on the syndrome of electrohypersensitivity. Now, we don't have, as I've said, we're only now beginning to really rigorously diagnose it. Clinicians can certainly diagnose nonspecific symptoms, but how do you rigorously tie those symptoms to an exposure? Traditionally, when we talk about chemicals that cause cancer and symptoms, we take a blood test. We measure the chemical in the body. It's a relatively straightforward thing. It's not so simple here. That's why development of laboratory tests is very important. But what you see is that uh, in the Bioinitiative Report, we tried to publish some guidelines for what would be safe. Now, this is where you really end up with some problems. For example, it's pretty well accepted by everybody in the field of cancer, that if something causes cancer, there is no level of exposure that does not cause cancer. In other words, there's a linear dose response curve. Now, there may be an exposure that's so low that you can't actually measure the increase of cancer, but there's no threshold below which there's no risk. Now, we can't say with great confidence that's the case for radiofrequency fields. I'm confident that it is, just on the basis of my experience with chemicals and carcinogens. Now, obviously, uh, there are electromagnetic fields in nature. Life evolved with some. What we've done in the last few years is dramatically increase our exposure enormously. We didn't have Wi-Fi or cell phones. 40 years ago. Uh, cell phones were actually invented in the US, but they were first marketed in Scandinavia. Uh, so, you know, we're doing an experiment on the human population. And now we're expanding around the world with 5G and putting these cell towers everywhere. Almost every school has Wi Fi. Almost every school administrator is oblivious to the fact or don't want to hear that they may be putting their children at risk. I think that we have uh, great problems with our elected representatives. Most of them are unaware of the issue, or if they're aware of it at all, they're aware that the, the telecommunications companies are giving them a lot of money to increase the this outgrowth of, of 5G and other forms of exposure. Uh, the, the concerned citizens are usually not ones that can can subsidize uh, elected representatives. So the, the solution is to have the public informed, because our politicians respond when people bang on their door and say, I demand that you protect our health. That's why we're here tonight, to try to let all of you know that this is an issue that's important to you, it's important to your family, and that we need to do something about it. It's very difficult to put genies back in the bottle. Uh, and I'm, you know, we're not going to go back to a pre-wireless age. But there's so many obvious things we can do that would reduce our exposure and increase our health, and we need to find how to go about and do that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Carpenter. Next, I have the privilege of introducing Dr. Martha Herbert. She is uh, here in Massachusetts, a pediatric neurologist and neuroscientist. 
She founded the Transcend Research Program over at Mass General as part of a Harvard program. And she is also the founder of Higher Synthesis Foundation. And uh, she is the principal investigator and scientific director of a current project that she's working on called Documenting Project Hope. Oh, Documenting Hope Project, <coughs> apologies. So Dr. Herbert, thank you very much. So I'm going to talk to you about uh, what you so fantastically set the stage for, for the rest of us. Um, I got involved in this issue. I first heard about it in 2002. <clears throat> I went to a little seminar in the mountains somewhere by, uh, held by a, a journal, and I thought, this is really interesting and concerning, but I really don't know very much about it, but I filed it away as potentially interesting. And then, uh, in, for the next decade, I became involved in looking at the relationship of toxicants to neurodevelopmental disorders and began to see that, David, you were talking about how there are all these conditions that are associated with environmental health syndrome and electromagnetic sensitivity. And um, there seems to be something in common across them. And in my work on children in particular, but not only children with uh, neurodevelopmental disorders, I came up with a kind of a list captured from a lot of literature of physiological systems that are disrupted um, in um, environmental exposure. Now, I should say that for me, and in this documenting hope project that I work on, we operate on what we call the total load model or a cumulative impact, which means there are many exposures. There's no one exposure. We're walking around constantly expect, exposed to Wi-Fi, but there's also all kinds of chemicals in our water, in our air, in our food, and so forth. And we have in our bodies ancient systems that uh, are involved in processing chemicals and other things in our body. And that's what we have. We're not basically developing a new physiological pathway any, anytime somebody patents a new thing that you can be exposed to. So these things are shunted down various pathways, and those pathways can get overloaded. And you don't need a giant dose, giant dose of any one thing. You can have a lot of little doses that add up. So that's what the total load model says in a nutshell. So when you get to electromagnetic issues, um, in particular regarding the brain, electromagnetic properties of brain cells and of the whole uh, magnificent liquid crystal gel thing we have in our heads, the electromagnetic properties help explain our brain's computational powers. And um, not only in our brains, but actually every cell and every organ of our body has not only biochemistry, but electromagnetic signaling. And we need these things both in brain and body to be optimized in order to be at our best and to fulfill our potential. And at the same time, we're surrounded by exposures that are not developed in relationship to what would be best alongside of our own electromagnetic makeup. And so what we have is evidence that the electromagnetic fields and radio frequency radiations are important contributors to degrading the exquisite fine tuning of the optimal chemical electro fu electrical functioning of our bodies. Now, I, um, you mentioned Cindy Sage, and she approached me to write a, a paper for the bioinitiative, the second one, on autism and, um, and electromagnetic fields. And I turned her down about six times <laughs> because I was busy. And she finally got me. I still remember talking to her on a cell phone in an airport. And she talked me into it um, because I've been, you know, <laughs> I've been thinking about um, 
toxicants, I had been thinking about them, they affect the brain, but the activity of the brain is at the electromagnetic level. So in order for toxic substances to affect brain waves, they've got to be, there's a word, transduced into the electromagnetic domain, whereas we're walking around with exposures that are speaking the language of the brain in terms of electromagnetic waves, but they're not speaking the native language of any organism. So the, the, we have confusion in how we deal with this. So this is something to think about. And it's also, I should say, that a lot of um, inventions that we are surrounded by in our consumer products and our infrastructure are basically developed in ways that were comfortable for what people had been using in laboratories. And they didn't really necessarily try, or mostly do not try, to make them more congenial to living organisms. So, so I want to review for you some of the ways that electromagnetic fields and radio frequency radiation can damage living systems. So first of all, there's cellular stress. Production of heat shock proteins is an example, which even in the absence of actual heat, the map, the, these radiation forms damage cell membranes. The integrity of the cell membrane and of the membranes of the subcellular organ, organelles in the body are really important for protecting one domain of activity, which may have need to go on in an acidic environment from another, another domain of activity, which needs to be carried on differently. When, these, when this starts to be leaky, it again, it, it again degrades the optimal tuning of the function, not only of, the, of brain cells, but of cells throughout the body. Now, mitochondria are the energy factories of our cells. And mitochondria, there's plenty of evidence that these forms of radiation damage uh, mitochondrial uh, production of energy. Mitochondria are exquisitely vulnerable not only to electromagnetic fields and radio frequency radiation, but to tens of thousands of chemicals. Our brains operate with the highest energy demand in our body, so to have a problem with mitochondria, even a subtle problem, starts to make our functioning less than optimal. Oxidative stress is something that comes along with breathing oxygen in an, our environment. There's a normal production of uh, pro-oxidants, which we usually quench in our bodies with antioxidants. But when you get overloaded by pro-oxidants causing oxidative stress, you fall behind. And oxidative stress is associated with many diseases, from heart disease and diabetes to cancer and neurodegenerative diseases. These, radio, these, these radiations are genotoxic. They damage proteins. This has been abundantly dem demonstrated. And maybe some of you <clears throat> have heard about glutathione. It's the most, uh, it's, the, it's a very strong detoxification and antioxidant produced in our bodies. Um, and it is one of the major pro antioxidants to, to mop up the oxidative stress. And it's depleted by EMF radiofrequency radiation. Cal calcium channels are very, very important throughout the body and also especially in the nervous system and in the heart. And these, the function of these channels is altered as well, uh, which is really bad for tuning of functions. Now, impacts on the brain. This is a paper that was published uh, by Nora Volko, uh, who was is at the National Institute of Drug Abuse. So what you see is a, a kind of a heat map of the impacts. You see on the left that there's more red. That indicates there's a greater uh, response in the brain, and it's not an optimal response when the cell phone is on, than when the cell phone is off. And this is an indication of glucose metabolism that gets higher. Uh, and there's, so then this is not a constructive uh, reaction of the body. 
So not only do you have damage to cell membranes, but you have damage to barriers, the gut-blood barrier, the blood-brain barrier uh, in various organs. Um, you, the, there's evidence that the entropy, that is the sort of randomness, so to speak, of brain waves is increased through exposure to these radiation forms. These radiation forms can interfere with sleep and the brain's production of melatonin. They can contribute to immune problems. And all the little things are footnotes here, the little brown things at the end. And can, can increase, and they can contribute to stress at chemical, immune, and electrical levels. And I would say this total load cumulative impact, because it interacts with a lot of other stressors at these levels. Now, there's also been uh, evidence that there are impacts on fertility. Um, <clears throat> the laptop compu computer is, um, they in induces currents which are concerning pretty close to, uh, they're not within the safety realm but not really low. Um, and um, the power supply also induces electrical currents in the body. And really, even though they're called laptops, it's really not healthy to use laptops on your lap, especially if you're pregnant. You want to keep it on a surface above you and don't have it plugged in when you're working on it because that at least reduces the intensity of the exposure. Now, this picture is hard to read, but basically, um, the, the electromagnetic fields can impact many level of supports and stages of fertility, including impacts on the pineal gland, the sperm, the ovary, the embryo, and of course, the, or, the next generation of organisms, human and other, that uh, grow up with these exposures, creating those kinds of changes. Here is some work showing that the, the brains of children and adolescents are more vulnerable. So you see on the left is a 34-year-old, on the middle is a 6-year-old, and on the right is a 3-year-old. The brains are not only smaller, they're shaped differently, the bones are thinner when you're younger, especially quite young. And so having a device really close to the head of a young child penetrates, you can see, further into the brain. And the, um, here it says, when used by children, the average radio frequency energy deposition is two times higher in the brain and 10 times higher in the bone marrow of the, marrow of the skull compared with mobile phone use by adults. And here is a study it's a modeling, it's a mathematical modeling using commonly used methods of the absorption level of radiation from a tablet in the brain of a child. And this showed that the penetration, you don't see an adult image here, but there, there are adult images in the paper, penetrates substantially into the head of the child just from more or less having it in the position that you see in the photograph there. Now, there exist international guidelines for diagnosis of, of electromagnetic EMF-related illnesses. Um, there, they've actually only been developed by the Austrian Medical Association and, uh, ha and the consensus paper on these medical guidelines has been developed. And these are available online. Electromagnetic or electrical hypersensitivity syndrome is um, it's very disabling. And, and most physicians wouldn't really be trained to piece together this, the different symptoms or e into that diagnosis or even to think of asking what a person's exposure levels may be, sources of exposure and exposure levels may be. So uh, it's, it's important to, for us to raise awareness 
children in schools who are in this high Wi-Fi environment may be having symptoms that their doctor wouldn't put together. And if you don't think of it, you might try treating them with drugs or other kinds of treatments where a mitigation of the exposure might be much more effective. So what are some solutions? First of all, um, I was talking in the beginning and, and throughout about total load or cumulative impact. The cumulative impact of stressors, whether or exposures, whether they be chemical or electromagnetic, is, are pulling you down. And I mentioned that antioxidants are among the things that can help protect you. A variety of nutrients can build resilience so that you're less vulnerable to the exposures that you get. Um, and uh, antioxidants, the rainbow diet, where there are different uh, uh, chemicals in plants of different colors that are all have various kinds of protective functions. Um, so you definitely want to build your resilience. You also want to re avoid unnecessary exposures. Uh, don't carry your cell phone in your pocket. Uh, don't keep things on. We've already heard some of this. Uh, so you want to improve the support of resilience and you want to reduce exposures both to electromagnetic fields and to other sources of negative impact. And meanwhile, given how much we've already learned about the subtle biological, cellular, and electrical impacts of EMF and RFR, we need to up to date, up to update what David so elegantly explained as seriously out of date regulations to take into account how exquisitely vulnerable we now know we are, and to aim for safer ways of meeting our needs, more congruent with the way organisms work, for communication and for other devices that, that need or generate EMF or RFR. And then going back to the great step one of Alcoholics Anonymous, admit that we have a problem, <laughs> and then do something about it. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Herbert. And now we'll get to hear from Dr. Ronald Melnick, who is the retired senior tech, uh, toxicologist at the National Institutes of Health um, that just completed that $30 million study on radio frequency and cell phones and indeed found clear evidence that this is not something we should be exposing ourselves or our children to. He has a, a wonderful career uh, working for our highest posts in our government at the White House Office of Science and Technology. He served on that international agency for research on cancer and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. He's received the American Public Health Association's David R. Paul Award for Science-Based Advocacy in Public Health. And as I mentioned, he was the lead designer on the National Toxicology Program Study. So Dr. Melnick. Thank you for the invitation to speak here. And thank you for the large crowd that came out to uh, hear these presentations. What I want to talk about is the utility of the National Toxicology Program study for assessing human health risks. The National Toxicology Program is considered the premier institute in the world for developing information that can be used to determine human health risks. And that's one of the main objectives of that program. It is headquartered at the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences located in North Carolina. It is the one institute of the National Institutes of Health that's not located in Bethesda, Maryland. So the National Toxicology Program reports directly to the uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services. The director is the director of both the National NTP, NIEHS. There's a lot of acronyms in the government. Sorry about that. But 
it also is composed of the FDA as a component. The main one is the NIEHS, which is part of NIH, and also Center for Disease Constro <coughs> Control or the of the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. There's also an oversight committee, which includes agencies such as the FDA, EPA, uh, I don't need to go through all the other, OSHA's Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Now, the National Toxicology Program receives nominations from anybody for study of agents that might impact on human health. These nominations can come from universities, the public, anybody here could write a nomination. It would require a little justification, uh, labor industry, but the most of them come from the federal and state agencies, in particular the National Cancer Institute, uh, is probably first, FDA is also a nominator. The studies on cell phone radio frequency radiation emitted from wireless communication devices came to the NTP from a nomination by the Food and Drug Administration. And the request was for studies of toxicity and carcinogenicity for, so that studies would be provide data that could be used to assess risks to human health. That was what they asked for. The reason was that at that time, the use of cell phones was increasing astronomically in the human population, and exposure guidelines were based on protection from acute injury from thermal effects. Heating was the one effect that was considered to be a known effect of radio frequency radiation. But the concern was maybe it's not protective against non-thermal effects with long-term exposure. The FDA, F FCC developed exposure guidelines, which are 20 years old. These were designed, again, to protect against adverse effects that might occur in tissues or, or body temperature of, of an increase of one degree centigrade. They, exposed monkeys to radio frequency radiation, did some modeling, came up with an exposure rate, SAR, a specific absorption rate. This is the rate at which the energy enters into the body and into various tissues. The SAR was considered four watts per kilogram as the level of which uh, heating might start to occur, and anything below that was considered to be non-important to health. But to set exposure limits for the general population, they pick a number, they divide it by 50, and said that the average whole body exposure could be 0.08 watts per kilogram. And if you looked at your phones, as David asked you to do, you may have seen a much higher level, probably 1.2 or so. This is averaged over any one gram of tissue. Now, this is an important point, the difference between whole body and averaged over one gram of tissue, because when it's whole body, you don't have a sense of what is the dose in specific organs within the body. So, for example, if this is the antenna of a phone, if I hold it next to my head, this is where the radiation is. If I divide that dose by the rest of my body, I'm saying that the dose to my brain is being diluted out because I'm adding all my feet, my thighs, everything else. <laughs> so the 1.6 watts is the one which we're really focusing on because that's the one that we're most concerned about in terms of holding and where the antenna is in relationship to uh, people's usage. The NTP conducts their studies in animals. Animals are used for assessing human health risks, and this is a current practice and accepted by the EPA, uh, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, the FDA. They use animals for uh, drug development. And that, the reason for this is that the processes of disease are similar. It's unethical to uh, test for carcinogenicity in people. Every known human carcinogen is carcinogenic in animals when tested adequately. 
the exposures can be controlled so that we can eliminate potential confounders with something else the cause of any type of effect. And animal studies can eliminate the need to wait for sufficient cancer data before implementing public health policies. Uh, cancer can have a long latency, and rather than waiting to see if the population is affected, animal studies can uh, enhance that. So when I began this project, I had two simple objectives. One, test the hypothesis or the assumption at that time that cell phone radiation at essentially non-thermal exposure intensities was incapable of causing any adverse health effects. As David mentioned, the thought at that time was, and the assumption, which we were well aware, that if it's not thermal, there could not be an adverse health effects. So let's test that hypothesis. And if we saw an effect, what is the dose-response relationship so that data would be available to assess human health risk? So th there were multiple aspects to this study. These studies were conducted in what are called reverberation chambers. It's essentially a large, it's a room. It's like a large microwave oven, but it has an antenna in it, which is emanating the radio frequency radiation. And there are paddles that are stirring the electromagnetic fields to create a homogeneous environment. That was first demonstrated. We then did what we call a thermal pilot study. What are the effects of radiation and how high well, could we go to see that one degree rise in, of centigrade in rats and mice? We used modulated radio frequency radiation. The modulations are what the networks use for multiple access. You may see your network is either CDMA or GSM. These are two different types of modulations. Uh, we use 900 megahertz and 1900 megahertz since those are the ra range, the ra areas in which uh, cell phones communicate with the cell towers. Uh, we did a pre-chronic study just to see how uh, animals would do prior to conducting the chronic study. The chronic study then was to ter determine the effects of chronic exposure, including carcinogenicity, of GSM and CDMA modulated cell phone radio frequency radiation. We had 90 animals per group. Now, risk is something that you think, may, or you think or may not think about, but risk is what is the likelihood of one in a hundred, one in a thousand, one in a hundred thousand, one in a million. With 90 animals per group, this is an insensitive assay because we need 5% or 10% response rate to say we see an effect. So we have to challenge that type of one degree temperature rise. The SARs in rats were 0, 1.5, 3, and 6 watts per kilogram because the thermal pilot study showed that the exposure of rats to those levels, they were able to maintain their temperature within one degree centigrade. The exposures began during pregnancy on gestation day five and continued until necropsy at 108 weeks. Now the NTP has defined what they mean by levels of evidence of carcinogenic activity. Clear evidence means there is a dose-related increase in cancers. Uh, they may be benign and malignant. Some evidence means there was an increase in tumors and it was re related to the agent to which the animals were exposed. Equivocal doesn't mean nothing, means there's an increase in tumors, but it may or may not be agent related. And other factors besides statistics comes into play. For example, are these common tumors, uncommon tumors? Uh, are there also precancerous lesions or uh, hyperplasias at the same site? The findings just summarizing here on the carcinogenicity was that there was clear evidence for both GSM and CDMA for heart schwannomas. Schwannoma is a Schwann cell which wraps around the nerve. This is the insulator of the nerve. Uh, there was clear evidence for both in male rats in brain. There was also some evidence which is agent related for gliomas. These are the glial cell tumors in male rats 
And as you can see, there were also hyperplasias, which are lesions that are precancerous, pre-tumorous lesions also observed. There was equivocal evidence, which meant that it may or may not be agent-related, but there were signs of increased response. So what are the key findings? There were others as well. Cell phone radiation caused cancers and preneoplastic lesions in the heart and brain. There was also measurement of DNA damage in the brain cells of rats and mice. There was a heart muscle disease called cardiomyopathy, which was dose-related increase. And as I mentioned, the rats were exposed in utero. Uh, there was reduced birth weights. Another conclusion is the assumption that non-ionizing radiation cannot cause cancer or other health effects other than tissue heating is wrong. So comparing this to the IARC monograph, which came out in 2000, and, uh, the, the meeting was held in 2011, uh, as I said, the NTP found cancers in the heart, schwannomas, and brain gliomas. The IARC evaluation was that it was possibly carcinogenic to humans. This was based on increases in two, study, in two overall studies for glioma and acoustic neuroma. This is a Schwann cell tumor of the nerve in the ear canal. This was both in the, what's called the interphone study. That was a multinational uh, study. I, I, I'm not sure exactly how many, approximately 10 countries participated. The U.S. didn't. And in Sweden, by Hardell, uh, found numerous uh, reports of his case control study showing increases in schwannomas and gliomas. So what are the expected next steps? Well, as I mentioned, this was nominated to the NTP by FDA. So now they need to do their job. Uh, the nomination to conduct the quantitative risk assessment so that FCC can develop health protective exposure standards. FCC has the guidelines, but they're not health-based. They're based on heating. FDA has that data, but they refuse to use it. Because of the widespread use of cell phones, even a small increase in cancer risk would have a serious health impact. So as I said, what is risk? Is it one in 1,000, one in 100,000? If it's one in 100,000, that's still a lot of people when you consider there's approximately 5 billion or 4 billion users worldwide. And precautionary principles should be promoted, not if you are concerned. The health agencies need to promote uh, pre precautionary principles, especially for children and pregnant women, because the cancer risks may be greater in children due to the increased penetration, which was shown by others, of cell phone radiation within the brains of children, and the developing nervous system is more susceptible to tissue damaging agents. We know this from numerous studies with chemical agents. So a lesson learned, we should no longer assume that any current or future wireless technology, including 5G, which is being rolled out, is safe without adequate testing, because to do otherwise is unethical. Thank you. And uh, social work clinical psychotherapist for both children and adolescents, special education therapy, and work in an ADHD clinic. She is the executive director of the Environmental Health Trust, and we are so fortunate to have her with us tonight. She is a tireless workhorse on behalf of all of our children. Um, she coordinates scientific programs, talks all over the world, and collaborates with the uh, leadership team of the Environmental Health Trust to pull all that off. She's done an amazing job of compiling information out at the Environmental Health Trust. It's a terrific resource for anybody who wants to go out and investigate this issue. And she has developed a number of educational resources for communities and our government. And we have a number of um, handouts here on the tables. Everybody's welcome to take with them before they leave today, too. So 
Theodora, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. Do I have the, um, yeah, thank you. Thanks. So there's a lot to say about this issue in terms of what international policy um, is happening now and also in the United States because scientists have been saying and the roar is louder than ever that um, there's documentation that wireless radiation can cause harm and we need to have protections. And of course, protections require policy change. So I um, started out uh, about almost a decade ago now as a social worker and I was in an in-house therapy uh, program I directed in-house in the schools. When I heard that wireless could be harmful, I was very skeptical. I loved my phone and I realized that I had certain assumptions at that time. Um, uh, but I decided to look into it because I had two young children. I assumed that they safety tested devices before they came on the market. Except I found, as was discussed, the EPA was defunded and in fact there was no pre-market testing. I assumed that there is constant research going on to, on this issue to ensure no harm, only to find out that really there were only a few studies, one which Dr. Melnick discussed and um, Dr. Herbert talked about, the NIH study, the, the $30 million NTP study, which found clear evidence and that took uh, years to finally see the results of. I also assumed that there are scientists with electromagnetic radiation expertise tasked to systematically review the science to ensure safety because, of course, you wouldn't put it out there if you didn't know. Um, and, and the answer is no. In fact, there was an interagency work group which I spent hours on the phone trying to track people down and finally ended up with a retired person in the EPA who basically told me to reduce radiation to my children. The, um, interagency radio frequency group is all but defunct in that it barely meets, has no agenda, no notes, and they have no power. Um, and I don't even know what's going on with them. I'd, I'd like to know more about what they talk about a few times a year. Also, I assume that low levels would have no effect and can't harm us. And uh, as many studies have shown, low levels, even at very low levels, low levels can have an effect far level than what our FCC protect us from. So I was shocked uh, to learn, and this is research, Environmental Health Trust is a, a virtual scientific think tank. Um, our scientists and scientific advisors both public re publish research and also educate policymakers and create educational information for the public on the issue of wireless and electromagnetic health. So I, I was shocked, I mean, I, you can't see it, right? But this is imaging um, done by some of our advisors from uh, Brazil, engineers, which show the radiation off the antenna of a laptop on the lap. The first image and yellow is the highest intensity, and then it goes from yellow to orange to red to purple. You can't see it that well with light, but you can go online to our, uh, we have YouTube and we have lectures on our website where you can learn more about this, showing the field coming off the antenna, and then this next image is penetration into the tissues of the body. So for years, and, and this was, um, it's been a long road for me because I started out as a concerned parent and started working on this issue for many years at a time when I spoke to my school about this and they were like, what? And here we have, this is from 2014, this is in St. Augustine School in Italy where the counselor is removing the Wi-Fi router. This is after the, the parent group uh, petitioned to have that done. And the parents are looking on, this is a ceremony, <laughs> sort of a celebratory ceremony as they, they do this. And in fact, there are many regions in Italy, as an example, where the mayor or the local government um, has called for the removal or they have removed the Wi-Fi. In 2017, the Minister of the Environment uh, ordered electromagnetic reductions. And one of the, one of the pieces of that was cabled uh, internet in school as the safest way to get the internet. Worldwide, many countries have been taking action on this issue. And I'm not going to talk about cell phones. There is a lot going on with cell phones. I'm talking about Wi-Fi today. So not only are private schools worldwide um, starting to look into this and many reduce, removing or reducing the Wi-Fi radiation exposure, I can tell you that I was at 
my husband is a musician, and ever since he volunteered to do music at my daughter's nursery school 10 years ago, he continues to do it every year. So every year he goes back and plays music. And a teacher came up and tapped me on the shoulder in the middle of the auction and said, hey, I was thinking about you because we removed the Wi-Fi <laughs> at the school. <laughs> and I was like, wow, so here we are. Um, we have on our website a list of schools. We have a running list of schools that are removing the wireless. Belgium, uh, France, Israel, Cyprus, and French Polynesia banned in nursery school. Uh, France has a new law since 2015 where it's turned off in the schools as the normal setting, only turned on when needed by teachers who are not using the, the wired access, and many teachers are aware and utilizing that. Um, in Cyprus, they have uh, the health minister has called for the removal of, of wireless in the uh, elementary schools. Um, there were reductions in Israel. You can go on our website under international policy and learn more about this. This is a still from French Polynesia's educational campaign. They have this one minute video which shows you the electromagnetic radiation in your home and your community. And here is a still from the living room. You can see the phone, the router, and in, in fact the gaming, uh, the gaming console which I find when I go to people's homes is a really large contributor to a child's exposure, especially when I walked into a friend who had all these consoles in her teenage son's bedroom. They are radiating all the time when they're powered on, even when you're not using them. This is uh, still from a video from the Cyprus uh, Children and Environmental Health Protection uh, Committee. They have three public service announcements, which are, everyone must watch them. Please click on Cyprus on our website and watch these amazing videos. We translated them, and I'm half Greek, so my mom actually helped with the first one, which is how I learned about them. Haifa, Israel, this is an image from a news article when the mayor of Haifa ordered the Wi-Fi out of the school. He is quoted as saying, if there is doubt, there is no doubt. We must take extra precaution. And I was honored to be at a conference um, at Hebrew University in Israel, also with Dr. Melnick, where Ruben Kerman, the Haifa head of IT, actually presented how they um, got everything wired, put in these wired installations, and showed the, over here are from his, uh, from his PowerPoints, how do, you, how do you set up a room so that the kids can be learning and also have wired access and, of course, not trip on the wires. And he talked about how they developed in-house capacity to really make that work. The Council of Europe in 2011, um, in their resolution 1815, talked about reducing exposure to the public. And one of the points of that resolution is the recommendation to give preference to wired internet connections and strictly regulate the use of mobile phones by school children on school premises. There's a lot in that resolution that's also online on our website. Um, the Maryland State Environmental Health and Protection Advisory Council uh, is a, uh, the, um, it is a body of the state of Maryland, where I'm from, and they issued a report. These are the first recommendations from a body of the state in the United States on reducing radio frequency radiation in the classroom. And I'm just going to highlight a few points that I think are really important from the recommendations. There are a 19-member panel. About half are representatives from Department of Health, Department of Education, um, and there are appointees and representatives from the House and the Senate as well. So they recommend limiting exposures as much as feasibly practical and to consider using wired devices in the classrooms. And I thought this was really important because there's a lot of renovating happening in our state. If new classrooms are to be built, network cables can be added at the same time, providing network access. This is simple, this is easy, it should happen today, as should, I believe, putting in wired internet rather than wireless. But this, moving forward, is something that 
where is the cost? In fact, it's, it's going to be cheaper. Once you get those LERs running wires and setting up your designing your school. So you can learn more about that online. Um, and they're still doing a lot of work on that. I was just at a meeting last month. The um, United Educators of San Francisco, I was honored to um, do a webinar with Dr. Cindy Russell of Physicians for Safe Technology, another important resource on radio frequency and electromagnetic fields. And they actually, the webinar is online on our website and, and we have it on YouTube as well. We've been doing replays with Q and A's for a couple months now. I think we've done like three or four of them. They issued a resolution, as have several PTAs um, and teacher unions, on uh, enhancing technology safety. And they did this after California, the, the, the Department of Health of California, issued recommendations on how to reduce exposure to your cell phone. They explained how when you were exposed to a lot of radiation and how you could reduce exposure. Uh, Dr. Moskowitz, who has a website, uh, Safer Electromagnetic Safety, we can look up Dr. Moskowitz, Safer, I forget the, e say, okay, thank you. Um, he actually needed to do a, uh, a public information request and then go to court to get uh, these recommendations and the drafts out because it had been so long. As it turned out, they had, for almost a decade, been drafting and redrafting and drafting recommendations on how to reduce exposure. And the first recommendations were, in fact, um, for reducing exposure occupationally to state employees. And they talked about recommendations to protect employees and their families, which included uh, purchasing uh, technology which was safer and had low electromagnetic radiation, not to use decked phones, to use corded phones instead. So um, we talk about a lot in this webinar as well. I hope that you will um, go online to see it. I should talk about the resolution, though. What they're recommending now is that these recommendations on how to reduce exposure to your cell phone are posted in the schools, that teachers are educated, that parents are educated. and. That um, we're, we're doing another webinar, I think, soon. There are many other PTAs and teacher unions, as I talked about, and you can go online to, we have a teacher union page, and everything is hyperlinked, so you can click on it. Um, the United Federation of Teachers, the New York State Teacher Union, which also has a webinar with Dr. Magda Havas with Grassroots Environmental, and we have in this room Patty and Doug Wood, who um, facilitated that webinar. In these many reports and documentations from, from teachers and workers in the school who've really looked into this, they talk about reducing exposure to pregnant women, informing staff, labeling Wi-Fi routers, having on and off switches, or using Ethernet, which is safe and doesn't have this radiation connected to it, and having Wi-Fi uh, free zones. We have all of those up online as well. And I thought this was just, I just wanted to quote this uh, letter from a PTA. This is near my town. It's from the Hillsmere Elementary School. And this was a letter because there it was a cell tower going up near the school. They said, we could go on citing studies and appeals from scientists, but the bottom line is there is evidence that exposure to current wireless radiation causes harm. And there are too many unknowns about the full impact of wireless technology. And I think a lot of people come at various places, but a lot of parents sort of end up here. Uh, we have here the New Jersey Education Association, which did an article uh, which is online, as well as a two-page PDF on how to reduce exposure to and minimize your risk from wireless devices. And I'm pointing out two things that are important on their uh, recommendations, hardwiring devices that connect to the Internet and hardwiring all fixed uh, devices such as printers, projectors, boards. I was at uh, my daughter's basketball game and realized that even the scorecard 
was being wirelessly connecting and there was this huge router and it was sitting right in front of the person who was doing it. And I thought, they don't know. You're not supposed to be that close to it. No one was saying, hey, keep a distance. I mean, it likely says that there needs to be a 20 uh, centimeter distance, which is about eight inches, in order to maintain FCC limits because they're only tested whoops, with that distance. And nobody knew, and people are running around and crowding and talking, and people need to know. And we should be, we can easily be using wired for that particular need, the way, certainly the way that room was set up. The Baby Safe Project is an invaluable research and educational campaign, a joint initiative with grassroots environmental education. That's baby, oh, it went over, but it's babysafeproject.org. They have recommendations for, on how pregnant women can reduce exposure. There is an appeal that has been uh, signed on to by I think over 240 or uh, 270. 270 now doctors, educators, public health experts on urging women to reduce exposure. And if you watch the press conference online, you can see Dr. Hugh Taylor, who's chief of obstetrics at Yale, <coughs> talking about the research that his lab did where they exposed pregnant mice to cell phone radiation and then tested the offspring and found increased hyperactivity and um, memory, more memory issues in the, the babies when they got a little bit grown up and got tested. And there's recent research, I don't have a slide on this, but um, showing, it's replicated research showing damage to teenagers' memory after one year of heavy use of cell phone to the head. So what will it mean for a lifetime of exposure? What will it mean for all of these hours and hours a day in schools where there's wireless and also um, cell towers near schools? And I put this up because it was covered in Newsweek and everywhere. Uh, we've been keep compiling all the news stories happening with this, but this is in Repon, California, where this is the headline from Newsweek, parents concerned his fourth child diagnosed with cancer while attending a school with a cell tower on campus. Um, there were actually a couple staff members as well who developed cancer. And recently, and parents have been advocating on this for years, actually, at this particular school. But um, recently when there was another student diagnosed they have been educating, and more and more is happening there. There were two walkouts. There were um, two, two walkouts with hundreds of students refusing to go to school. And we just heard, I think two days ago, that the school district asked the company, can you please remove the tower, even though they were under contract? And I heard that now Sprint is saying that they are going to move the cell tower. And there's important research not discussed tonight, but you can go online to read about this radiation promoting tumors out of Jacobs University at very, very low levels. So when you mix carcinogens with electromagnetic radiation having um, tumor promotion effect. All of these uh, medical organizations are recommending reducing exposure. The American Academy of Pediatrics has recommendations on how to reduce exposure. If you plan to watch a movie, download it first, then switch to airplane mode in order to avoid unnecessary radiation exposure. There are so many ways that we are unnecessarily exposed to this that we can decrease. Um, and you can go online again to learn more about that. The Collaborative for High Performance Schools has criteria. We know what to do. We just need the political will to do it. And this is our website, um, ehtrust.org. Um, so please learn more at Environmental Health Trust. And I thank you so much. Hi, Frank. Hi. Yeah. Well, thank you for the uh, invitation and the opportunity to join uh, the rest of this distinguished panel and talk about concerns that we have over the exposure in the classroom to not only students, but teachers as well. I apologize I am not able to get there in person. Uh, hopefully this will work uh, to get uh, these concerns across to, to you and the audience. 
On the next slide, I thought it'd be worthwhile just talking about a little bit about my bio. Um, I have spent my entire career in the technology sector. So being in my uh, decade, I've seen and experienced a significant amount of benefits that can come from the implementation of technology. I've also seen the potential harm if technology is not going to be implemented correctly. And in my opinion, our implementation of technology in the classroom today is not safe. Uh, and I don't think that's even like over the last five years I've had the opportunity to meet with uh, uh, international experts, individuals from uh, organizations such as institutions such as Harvard, Yale, Columbia, some of them are uh, distinguished members of the panel. I've had the opportunity to meet with a, um, an advisor to the World Health Organization, and he goes into developing countries and helps them create and start their cancer research facility. I've also had the opportunity to spend, to spend time with one of the technical writers for Al Gore's team that won the Nobel Prize. So, so when I make a statement that our current implementation is harmful, I don't, I don't make that statement like uh, That's what caused me to uh, help co-found CFARS team over five years ago. Uh, we focus on really two things. One is educate and inform Canadians about the potential harm from uh, water devices and how to use it safely and also to really work with all three levels of government in Canada to try to create a safe environment. I joined the, the strong team at the Environmental Health Trust a couple of years ago, not only because of their advocacy work, but also in my view, I think uh, Environmental Health Trust is one of the only nonprofits in the world today that really focus, uh, focuses as well on high level uh, research in uh, controlling environmental uh, health hazards. Uh, on the next slide, I just highlighted a couple of areas uh, of manufacturing warnings. Every device from every manufacturer carries a warning about how to use the device safely so that it doesn't break FCC guidelines. Unfortunately, those devices are either on page 160 on four-point font in some manual that nobody reads, or in fact, they're buried about five layers below the initial screen. So legally, my industry is, uh, is protected. But I would argue that ethically, the behavior is actually, uh, should be questioned. Um, students and teachers and parents are simply unaware of these, uh, of these warnings that are, as they say, associated with every device. Two of the examples I have here, the Samsung device, which is a laptop is meant to put on your lap. If, it, if in fact, used that way, uh, it will break FCC guidelines. Like you've heard you know, some of the other speakers talk about the guidelines, in fact, are under eight out of touch. But even if, so if you don't keep that device eight inches away from your lap, it actually will harm you, um, even according to FCC guidelines. Uh, the iPad, you can try to read that, that the uh, instructions there. There's a convoluted way you have to position the laptop on or the iPad on your lap or away from your body, holding it a certain way so that the antennas are not held too close to your body so that in fact, mark harm. Uh, when it comes to cell phones, I don't have examples there, but every cell phone carries a warning. Minimum distance that's uh, that's uh, that's safe is at least a half an inch. Some devices need up to an inch uh, to be detected. On the next slide, we, talk, we start talking. Well, we initially talked about putting uh, routers and putting Wi-Fi in schools. We had one router that was actually uh, put out in the hallway, and it would provide the coverage of the as you can see now, we're starting to talk about high density Wi Fi design systems and some of the guidelines from, from the manufacturers. So, Cisco talks about, uh, you know, and the uh, use of uh, consider putting these access points um, under the seat because the signals are being attenuated. In other words, the signal is being absorbed by the students in the classroom. And oh, by the way, it's a pretty good way to just hide the device. Um, uh, the net here talks about uh, the demand, the significant increase in demand because of the multiple devices that are being uh, used. We've done some studies where, on average, there's at least two or three devices per student. So if you get 30 students in a room, there could be anywhere from 60 to 90 devices in that classroom, all communicating, all talking, all need information to uh, use. Uh, secure Edge. You know, very clearly said, don't even think about using a residential router because they're not powerful enough to provide this high density coverage that we need. Extreme Networks is one of the many, many organizations now talking about a mesh 
and with the system, so instead of each device talking to the router directly, we're now sending them all on the nodes, so that in fact each device can actually talk to every other device. So now you've got up to anywhere from 60 to 90 devices acting like little mini routers. And what that says is you've got 60 to 90 devices reading uh, all the students and the teachers in the car. Next slide is, is an example, and you get more and more of the yellow and red and the high end of not only coverage, but high end of the reading. And you can see in this configuration, we've gone well beyond one router per classroom. We're now starting to see where there's these hotspots across the whole uh, part of the classroom. It used to be because we worried about the student that was sitting at the fringe area where two routers may overlap coverage. Well, now that don't think it's a kind of this mesh networking system where everybody's actually bombarded. Uh, when my team or any other team would go in and install a system, they're worried about data transfer rates, they're worried about coverage, and they worry about minimizing the delay. Uh, there is absence. So therefore, you would put in maximum power, turn the devices up maximum power, you have the maximum number of routers that the organization can afford, with absolutely no regard for the exposure to potential harm to the students or teachers in the classroom. Uh, we did a, a, a test here in a local school in Oakville, uh, where we worked with a local manufacturer and the school, and by uh, shifting the routers around in the classroom, by turning down the power in, in the, uh, of each router, we were able to reduce the radiation in that school by 90% and had no impact on the coverage and the uh, ability for the students to do their work uh, in the, on the Wi-Fi system. The other concern that I have is that on each of these devices are individually approved by the FCC in terms of their radiation emissions and the amount of, of, of radiation that they submit. Unfortunately, there is no body that I'm aware of in North America, no government body, that actually measures the cumulative effect. So we went into a school, another school in Ontario, we measured the cumulative effect, and then exposure to those in that classroom from all of these devices, all communicating to the, to the routers and ball, went well beyond FCC guidelines. Now, you've heard the guidelines of that, and I think, well, here we've got situations now where we are actually breaking the guidelines because of the cumulative effect of all our devices. The next slide we'll talk about is the insurance companies. Insurance companies and insurance industries business is based on identifying future risk. If they don't identify future risk and they insure people for it, then they are actually going to be out of business. So we use uh, industry uses uh, insurance industry and the insurance sector as a bellwether to identify future risk. Can you see here, see here one example of an insurance policy where wireless providers are not able to get covered? A lot of them have to self-insure themselves because they don't have the coverage uh, from other insurance companies, insurance organizations. Uh, two bell mothers in that environment, uh, Lloyds of London, issued a white paper in 2010. And the white paper states, the risk associated with cell phones and wireless devices is comparable to the risk associated with asbestos. Another organization switched to it, Swiss Ray which is a world leader in reinsurance. In 2014, their white paper states clearly that electromagnetic fields are a potential emerging risk. On the final slide, you can see, okay, so you've heard a lot of examples and ideas on what we can do. I think, I think there has to be a fundamental shift in my industry, and then it can be driven by parents and teachers and students in the class to say, we have to reorient our whole mindset to the developers and the designers and installers of these systems to say, we have to provide cover, but at the same time, we have to think about minimizing radiation exposure to the people that are in the classroom. And some of the techniques that you've already heard about, using hardware connections, amazing paper by, by uh, Dr. Tim Chocolate, the challenge is the whole business piece around wireless devices. We know that wire uh, connections are safer, they're faster, uh, they're less, they're more reliable, they're less vulnerable to security and privacy attacks, and they're fundamentally safe. So, so you know, things are gone in, and Peter already gave some examples of you know, when you're building a new facility or renovating a facility, that's absolutely the cheapest and best time to put in uh, the wired solutions. If we can't always have hardwired connections, then turn off the routers, turn off the access points, and the devices might not use. Now, download the information. 
turn off the device, you put them in airplane mode, and you need to uh, turn off Wi-Fi, and then you can still run that, run the test, or run the, run the last test without having everybody use that necessarily with radio. You know, prohibit cell phones and other wearables that aren't even needed in the classroom from being turned on or being in the classroom at all. I think we need to go back and challenge my industry more to provide better solutions, not only the devices, but the software that supports it, to allow uh, the, um, the teachers and the students to use them in a safer environment. So I'll conclude the last point of my slide. Look, this is my experience with um, the situations like this, and I, I don't know that there's much different. When people feel a little bit exactly the same, you know, I've met with my teacher, I've met with my friends school, well, I've met with the board, and I can't get them to do it. And I think, and I urge you to continue to push, because as the statement that was made is, elected officials, you know, Okay. Well, Frank, I don't know if you can hear me, but I'm going to go ahead and thank you very, very much for your patience tonight and sticking with us on this. I'm going to go ahead and mute your camera and your microphone, and uh, we may have you back during question and answer if that's appropriate. Thank you. If you're creating a city oh, team right? for yourself and your family, so that when you're in your own home, you're you're oh. okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you own your home, you own your environment, protect yourself, protect your family, and you can then um, at least have several hours of rejuvenation and, and repair. All right. so I thank you. I will be around for the Q and A. I don't know if you can hear me. I want to add, we have all these handouts, including Environmental Health Trust, how to reduce exposures in schools. I hope everyone has a copy of this. It's all on our website. You can download um, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendations. And on the back, a study. Yeah, but we're going to turn you down now. And, and more. And also, um, some articles um, of the lesson of wireless radiation by Patty Wood, as well as an article by Dr. Melnick about the FDA needing to do its job with the NTP, which are copied and on these tables. So please take some of them now. Okay. All right. Uh, Hmm. Well, okay, so we wanted to spend just a few more minutes talking about where we are here in Massachusetts and what our options are to try and bring this issue forward. Right now, we are leading the nation with 19 bills to address man-made radiation, and there are many people in this room who have worked very hard to... Um, to speak to our legislators about that, to get bills written. So if you leave us with your email addresses, we will give you notice when those bills are coming up for public hearing. But don't wait. Reach out now to your state senators, to your state representatives, and say, please, let's get these things moving and moving fast. We also have four fact sheets drafted by the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Dr. Deborah Davis was... Um, very gracious to come here in Mass to Massachusetts with Frank Clegg and other experts in 2015. They met with the Department of Public Health. Uh, they were just getting funding back after their budgets were cut at 9-11, so they needed time to staff back up. In 2016, I was getting anxious because we were about to start yet another school year with our children sitting in microwave radiation. So I offered my tech writing skill set to the Department of Public Health and helped them to write a fact sheet, and it was about four pages. We went through a couple review cycles, and then they thought, this is pretty good. Now we're going to take it and put it into a series of four fact sheets, one for cell phones, one for cell towers, one for Wi-Fi, and one for high-voltage power lines. That was in 2016, and we thought we would have that out quickly, three months, he thought. It's now been two and a half years. So I don't know what's going on behind the scenes, but we have a sheet somewhere, or I'll send it out to you if I have your email address here, 
that lists who at the DPH should we be talking to about this. And I'd like to thank Keith Marciniak, who brought me into North Middlesex Regional School District. We educated as superintendent, the IT director, the school committee chairwoman, and then they offered to let us speak to school committee. And God love Keith, he's been going like every two weeks for the last two years, presenting new information. And every time they sit there looking like deer in the headlights. So Keith went and dug around on the Department of Education website and discovered that our districts are being held accountable from the state level for implementing all this technology. And so he put me in touch with Kenneth Clough, who is the Office of Digital Learning Director in Instructional Technology. And Keith and Kenneth Clow and I had a lovely conversation just last week about this. He's in touch with Commissioner Riley, and they are very much aware of this. Uh, Keith is going to be testifying tomorrow morning at the Department of Education's monthly board meeting. That is something that everybody in this room can do. You can sign up to speak and give public comment because they need to hear from more than just me and Keith and Ruth Rin, who did it last month. Um, so. At the Massachusetts Department of Public, I'm sorry, the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, they have a monthly board meeting and you just need to reach out on their website and say, I would like time to speak. You generally have three minutes at the beginning of a public health or a public meeting to offer your comment. Um, so back when we were developing these, the Worcester School Committee had us in and with great thanks to the people like Leslie, who's with us tonight, and Lance, and others from Worcester who have been critical in educating uh, the teams out in Worcester, both at the town level and the schools level. And at the point where we came in to educate there, Dr. Bob Knorr, who was the uh, director in the Bureau of Epidemiology in the Department of Environmental Health at the DPH, he actually sent them a list of things people can do as precautionary measures, and that's what that link will go to there. Um, and then the Department of Public Utilities. Some of you living in this area may know that National Grid has been piloting a smart grid program out there, which means without your informed consent, they come and they replace your old analog electric meter and replace it with a device that pulses microwave radiation at you and your loved ones all around the clock. That pilot is questionable. The Attorney General's office is investigating for cost overruns. Patricia Burke, with us tonight, has just been a champion in tracking all of the fraudulent activity around that. She's now working down in Rhode Island, trying to support people in New York, where National Grid is spinning that Massachusetts pilot went so great, so now we're going to do it in your state, too. <laughs> So uh, we had the privilege of presenting to the Department of Public Utilities last fall, and we said, how much time do we have? And they said, oh, we got the room for three hours. So we actually got to really, truly educate. I covered a lot of the materials that we heard here tonight, and Patricia drilled way down into that fraudulent pilot study. So, And Jan Johnson, who I know is here with us tonight, too, also came in and testified. Jan is a special education teacher, and she told us point blank what this technology is doing to our kids, and it's not good. Um, so the Attorney General's office, we had two assistant attorney generals at the Department of Ut Public Utilities hearings. So they're, they're getting informed on this. I actually chatted with Maura Healy at the State House one day. She put me in touch with her chief of staff. So they're hearing this, but when they first heard it, all they knew about was economic impact. They had no idea there were health risks. So the biggest lesson I've learned on this whole journey is don't go it alone. Get those around you educated and don't expect somebody else to fix this for you because oftentimes our public servants are serving the public. They're not public leaders. So we have to tell them what needs we need to have served. If we don't use our voice, nothing's going to change. So we have uh, contact sheets over here for you to take. And, you know, as we've discussed tonight, measure your exposures. It, this, this isn't rocket science. We can actually get a device that will show us what our microwave radiation emissions are. And here in my town of Ashland, I actually got a grant to put one of these on loan in our public library. This device is about $400. If there was no radio frequency in here, we just hear a little crackle confirming it's working. If it just lights up at green at the bottom, 
that's where the science is still discovering what the biological effects are. When it goes into yellow, that's where those symptoms of electrosensitivity might start creeping in. Headaches, nosebleeds, nausea, not sleeping, anxiety, depression, gut issues, all sorts of fun things. In red, we literally have thousands of studies all over the world showing this is biologically harmful. So even though most of us have turned off our wireless devices, we're sitting here under wireless access points. And you see it jumps up and down. That's the pulses. That's the peak exposure. So don't let anybody tell you, well, oh, yeah, the average is OK, because it's those peaks that are breaking our cells. All right? So um, measure. Go into your schools. Measure what you've got. And then you can take a router and plug an Ethernet cable into it, right? Plug it in on the back of the router. Then just plug your device in on the other end of the wire. Go into your settings and turn off all those antennas. And some people say, yeah, but the iPad and the Macs, everything's gotten so skinny, you can't really plug it into an Ethernet anymore. But you can. So this is the gigabit, the Thunderbolt to gigabit Ethernet adapter. I don't know, 20 bucks or something online. This will hardwire my daughter's MacBook. We figured out how to hardwire her cell phone. She uses an iPhone. It's the Lightning to RJ45 Ethernet LAN network adapter. So when she's home from college and she's home, we just got a little splitter so you can plug both things in at once. And you just plug it into your device, go into those settings, and turn all the radiation off. So when I first did this with my daughter, she was about 15 at the time and kind of probably tired of hearing mom talk about this stuff. Um, so I said, just plug it in and see if it works. And she goes, oh my gosh, it's so much faster, <laughs> right? So she's excited. And then I could see the wheels turn. And she said, so if I'm running my connection through the Ethernet cable and I've turned off all those antennas, does that mean it's not eating into my data plan? And I said, yes, because if she goes over budget, we make her pay, right? <laughs> so that's how I sold a teenager on this, right? Yeah. So, but there are other things. There's something called a pluggable. Some of the Android and, you know, Chromebooks and stuff, you can hardwire with this too. But you do need to look at the pluggables online. Uh, customers have written in to say, yeah, it works on mine, but there's... It doesn't accommodate it in this operating system. So before you buy it, make sure it's compatible. Um, so then once you've hardwired everything, measure again, because there's sneaky little antennas all over the place. Um, my printer, I thought I had everything off. And I was sitting there in my home office one day going, OK, I slept great last night. I ate a good, clean, organic diet. Why do I feel like the Earth is sucking me down again after an hour or two of sitting in my office? And so I pulled out my meter, turned it on, and it was my printer. Although the little light wasn't on the front, it turns out there were two antennas inside my printer. So I just had to go into settings and go off, off. So it is important to measure to make sure you're really getting all this stuff. You know, as we've discussed, it's just going to be like big tobacco all over again, which it kind of already is. But as we go towards solutions, we may need a transition period. You can't go from where we are today to hardwired tomorrow. So what can we do to reduce it? You can put your devices on timers, right, with multiple settings. So if somebody needs to have it on for a short period of the day, it can do that. You can put kill switches in. You can have electricians put in light switches. Um, and as Frank Clegg was indicating, you can reduce power consumption in the networks. And I'd like to give a shout out to Peter Sullivan of Clearlight, Clearlight Ventures. He has worked with the Palo Alto School District out in California. And they figured out, like Frank was saying, the industry gives us everything full tilt all the time. Boom, 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 boom. You can take that down 90% and still have connectivity without all of that all the time. You can talk to your manufacturers, encourage our schools to be telling the manufacturers, we need sleep mode. That thing shouldn't be pulsing if nobody's trying to make a handshake with it, right? In Europe, they have decked cordless phones. Remember, we all had wired phones at home at once. Then they got replaced by these digital electronic cordless telephones, the decked. Well, mine was sitting on my nightstand, pulsing all night long. And I wondered why I wasn't sleeping so great. Um, but in Europe, they already have cordless phones that only pulse when a call is in play. We should have that technology here. In Palo Alto, 
um, they discovered that they didn't really need to have the 5 gigahertz band that was now coming in with all their new network equipment. The 2.4 was all they were using, so why is that thing pulsing? They also discovered that there were Bluetooth antennas on and the iPads that they weren't even using. Um, and then they had brought in a new system, and when they tested, they realized the old system was still going too. So we just need to get smart about this and work with our schools to transition through and then eventually get to hardwired. Another important piece of this conversation, first, let's get the radiation out. But the industry has sold us that we need to have all this technology for the 21st century classroom for our kids to succeed. Well, the science shows us that is not how children properly learn. So the American Academy of Pediatrics has recommendations that children under three should have no screen time at all, right? And how many parents, you know, need to get something done so they just hand their kid a pacifier in the form of a screen? And then the New York Times has done some great reports lately, and actually there was a new one that came out today, a new article. But the gist of it is, is that, oh, today's one was called Human Contact is Now a Luxury Good, <laughs> right? Screens used to be for the elite, now avoiding them is a status symbol. Go figure on that. But as far as our schools go, back in October, uh, Nellie Bowles did a series of articles. The first one was the digital gap between rich and poor kids is not what we expected. America's public schools are still promoting devices with screens, even offering digital-only preschools. So go park your baby in front of a screen and leave them there. The rich are banning screens from class altogether. A dark consensus about screens and kids begins to emerge in Silicon Valley, right? Somebody quoted in there saying, I'm convinced the devil lives in our phones. And here, Silicon Valley nannies are phone police for kids. Child care contracts now demand that nannies hide phones, tablets, computers, and TVs from their charges. So what does Silicon Valley know that our schools haven't caught on to just yet? And then, uh, if you have a child who you've given a device to, and when you take that device away and the kid loses it, there is a very likely chance that that child is developing digital addiction. And that's not just a term that we banter around. The studies are showing that this uh, microwave radiation, as well as excessive screen time, are hitting the same receptors in the brain where we see alcohol, drugs, tobacco, pornography, gambling. So we need to be very judicious about what we are exposing our kids to. Dr. Victoria Dunkley is a child psychologist. She's written the book, Reset Your Child's Brain. She's got a four-week protocol where, as intimidating as it sounds at the outset, the first week you educate everybody around your child and say, we're going to do a detox. And then you have to actively parent again and plan what your children are going to be doing for the next three weeks and make it fun. And as you know, it sounds like a really scary challenge, but I'll tell you what, at the end of those, the kids are better, the family is better, and now you've got the ability to say, no, this is not ruining our lives or running our lives anymore. It's up to us as the parents. Dr. Katherine Steiner Adair wrote The Big Disconnect about parenting children in the digital age. And she's gone chapter by chapter through the different phases of childhood development from the wee little ones all the way up through high school and what technology is doing to us. Both of these books are very well resourced with scientific literature. So just know, as you raise this conversation and as you're scratching your head going, I think I'm seeing some of this in my own house or with my, friend, my daughter's best friend, or there are resources already here to help us get through this. So next steps. You have to educate, because nobody knows this exists, except for the 70 or 80 of us here in this room tonight. You're all to be congratulated for getting here on a busy night. None of us ever expected we'd have to make room for this issue in our lives. So to have a standing room only crowd is really just kudos to all of you. So start the conversations with those around you, then go to your schools. You don't want to go it alone. You'll be too easily swept under the rug. Educate those around you. I've had the privilege of helping to build a nonprofit out of the UK where we have distilled the science 
the risks, what other countries are doing, and medical best practices into a half hour course that anybody can take. Take it yourself, get your loved ones to take it, and then sit down around the table and say, okay, well, this is crazy. What's the first thing we might do? Maybe tonight we turn everything off and get a good night's sleep. The award-winning film Generation Zapped, um, I know a number of you have seen it and a number of you have actually hosted it. Uh, it's going to be tomorrow night. There's a free screening in Belmont at 6.30, if anybody would care to go. I believe Theodora is going to join me to co-host that one. Um, and I will come in. If you can talk to your library and ask for a screening, they'll pay for the licensing typically and may give me a stipend or something to come in for my time as well. Um, but it's 74 minutes with an award-winning filmmaker. Dr. Herbert's in it. Dr. Carpenter's in it. Um, Theodora's founder of the Environmental Health Trust is in it. So it's really, really well done. So bring me in. I'm local. I'm in Ashland, and I would be honored to come help educate your schools, your community, your libraries. And um, we are so very grateful to everybody who's come with us tonight to videotape. So long as we have your email addresses, we will push that out to you. We'll also post the videos out on Wireless Education's Facebook page and other social media outlets. All right. Thank you.